Um, all right. Anyway, so what I wanted to do in this classroom is show you guys a bit how I would handle the day three assignment um, and how you can, you know, interpret shadow mapping and how you can how you can add a, a process into your painting because there, believe it or not, there are many different processes to handling a painting. And it usually depends on a couple of things. Um, and it used to depend on the type of media that artists would use. And so that's why I have this list that you can see on the screen right now um, is where an oil painter would um, be more likely to first shadow map his uh, his shadows, of course, right? Get that figured out, then establish the darkest and the lightest values, and then move on to his half tones and eventually his highlights. Um, whereas if you're doing a water, if you're a watercolorist, you usually would start by going from light to dark, right? You've probably heard this before, and so you would start by staining the canvas, then establishing the half tones, then going into the shadow mapping, which isn't as graphic probably as you would with like acrylic or oils um, because it's very you can't layer a watercolor that many times so you it, it's a little bit more ambiguous but you're definitely still shadow mapping and then you're establishing your darkest values like almost at the end um, at, and an inker it's actually the same process but in reverse um, you're just not doing it with color is an inker would start with the darkest values, right? He would establish those ambient occlusions, then go into shadow mapping for like the hatching and the cross hatching, and then establish some half tones with lighter cross hatching. And then the highlights and the like the, the key light would be virtually untouched because the only thing that you're working with is is black color, basically. So it wouldn't be a good thing to to add any dark values into those um, highlight areas. And then what I do is a bit of a, of a mix and match um, where I like to first start by establishing my darkest values like an anchor would, right? Because I love to draw. So usually all my paintings start as a drawing. And so I establish my darkest values and then I work like a watercolor colorist where I stain the canvas first. So I, I, I make all the local values um, as if they would be in the, the key light, right? So I'm not establishing them as a half tone. I'm establishing them as a very light value. Then I start shadow mapping in order to separate my shadows from my light area. And then I establish my half tones, right? And so, as you can see, there are many different processes that you can use in order to create the result or even get the same result. It all has to do with how you, what's familiar to you, right? Maybe what's your background in traditional media um, if you're moving into digital and also just what seems to work for you because the best, you know, the best solution is always the process that you enjoy the most and the process that you understand the best. Um, and so that will probably come with trial and error, um, but also just from looking at other artists or um, just seeing what works for you in terms of also just seeing value, right? Because the why I'm using this sort of approach is because that's the best way for me to understand the colors that I'm working with and the values that I'm working in in order to create a believable uh approach or a believable realistic render. It's just that that's how I understand it. So that's why I'm using it. And that's not why. Um, so I'm not forcing my process onto you. And I want you to understand that there are different, you know, even a lot more than I've listed here, processes that you can go through. All right. Something that I just wanted to get out of the way so that we understand each other. Um, and so what I'm going to now do today is basically the day three assignment with a little bit of a twist because I'm gonna mix and match. So what you guys need to do this week is you need to study masters in day two and then use your invented legs from last week and paint it exactly in the way 
as you've studied from the masters in day two. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to, you know, pick again an invented leg like you see here from like a Frazetta, but I'm going to paint it in a Lion Decker fashion, right? Um, so if you got, if you stylized your legs last week in a, let's say, um, you know, let's say a Frazetta manner as well. And then this week you studied Frazetta, then obviously you're going to use a Frazetta style of painting for day three. However, if you've studied Norman Rockwell or you studied Bouguereau, then you're probably going to use Bouguereau's colors and values on your Frazetta legs from last week. So again, what I'm going to do now is I have these established Frazetta-ish legs. Um, and I still have a reference from Frazetta to see how he uses, you know, his stylization. But I'm going to paint it in a Lion Decker fashion because I absolutely love Lion Decker. Um, and again, what I'm just going to do now is I'm going to, as I said in, in my process, I first establish <clears throat> the darkest um, darks, which is the ambient occlusion. And that's going to be dependent on the direction of my light source. So I'm going to pick the same light source as Lion Decker, which is a light source coming from this direction. All right. All right. Cool. So now with that local color, this is the stain of this is what a water colorist would do, right? He would pick a lot of water on his brush and then stain the canvas to get to kill the white of the canvas. This is basically the idea. Now, the difference with a watercolorist to what I'm doing is I have the luxury to then on another layer add highlights, right? Whereas a watercolorist, what he would have to do is he would have to avoid the areas of where he thinks the light will be hitting, you know, and not paint there, right? Because the, the, the brightest highlights that he can get is the white of the canvas, unless he uses like white gouache to, to paint over that, right? Same. But, uh, okay, so now, that we have, you know, somewhat of our, we have a local value, we established our shadow map, we did the half tones to indicate a little bit more rolling of form and, and you know, um, light. And so we create a little bit more volume. Now we can add um, highlights, right? And the highlight is usually gonna indicate what type of form it is because um, if, you know, if you've painted simple forms like a cylinder, a box, you know, a sphere, they have very specific highlights, right? Um, and now it just becomes a kind of an exercise to create interesting looking highlights that just like the shadow map indicate both the form uh, as well as the direction of the light source and maybe the underlying structure such as anatomy or you know whatever. And so now let's do that following, you know, if we look at Lion Decker's example, we can see that again, even his highlights were carefully mapped out. Like highlight, highlight following the curvature, again, highlight. And also the highlights did not have the same form all of the time. Right. So again, graphic exercise, making things, keeping things interesting. That's what makes Lion Decker paintings so interesting. But it's not specific to Lion Decker, like I say in the shape design demo. Um, it's also like other artists use this type of graphical, um, let's say, indication, but then they would soften it up just to give it an even more realistic render. Because with, with Lion Decker, you do sometimes get that more plasticky, cartoony look some of the times, uh, just because everything is so graphic. Sometimes he really nails it and everything looks super realistic, even though it is graphic. But it's it's definitely not a given. 
So I'm just trying to do the same now. I'm trying to make an interesting looking highlight. Again, that has a bit of a triangular feeling. Just really wrap your head around the, the drawing assignment and then take that drawing assignment into all of the steps of this week. For, first go for the values, right? Take, t that's the day one assignment. Take color out of the equation. Just focus on the, the principles that I just talked about. Local value, shadow mapping, core shadow, half tones, and highlights, right? If you can do it in grayscale, you can do it in color. I'm 100% sure of that. Uh, everything's value. That's the most important thing, especially in digital, because you can actually see the value. So it's just it's just translating that value into color, wherein, whereas in traditional, that's a lot, hard, a lot harder to do. Uh, and then for day two, really focus on the color because you can then actually m study from the masters how they interpret that color, what kind of colors they're using to represent a certain value. And then you can all apply that into day three. So I hope that was clear. Thank you all for attending. Thank you for your questions. And uh, I'll see you in the next one.